The Provoke Podcast, brought to you by Provoke Media in partnership with Hill & Knowlton Strategies and produced by the International Broadcast Specialist Marketeers. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Provoke Podcast. This is Arun Sudhaman, and I'm joined today all the way from New York. Mm -hmm. New York? I'm in New York. New York. New York. You are. It's Vicky Chowney, Global Head of Content and Publishing at Hill & Knowlton Strategies. Vicky, how are you doing? I am doing very well, actually. It's a glorious day here, and... um, you know, we're busy, but we're almost at Thanksgiving, so I think everyone is looking forward to a much-needed break, mm. for sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this podcast. I, I'd actually assumed you would be off this week, um, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, so th- thanks for making time, I guess, because I think everyone can do with time off. Yeah, I think particularly at the moment when, you know, work and home is just bleeding into one another. It's important to be very strict and make sure that you do actually get time mm-hmm. off because people are just burning out because, you know, the hours are longer, there's no separation in your environments and that kind of thing. So, yeah, being able to properly switch off is important. Very important. So I, just, I should just note before we get going that, um, you know, our more recent listeners may not be aware that you were a regular on the Echo Chamber podcast, as it was once known. <laughs> I was. Um, this is going back like five years yeah. or some five or six years. Yes, back when we, we we used to record them in the studio in Farringdon in London. Mm, yeah, well, back when we used to, to do things in <laughs> yeah. studios. In you know, real life. When, you could go to a studio. No. Yeah, you can't. I mean, we still use that studio in London, or at least Maya does. Um, of course, we don't use the echo chamber name anymore. Echo chambers are less innocent than they were. Yes, I hear you. I think back back then it was more about um, amplifying things that we all wanted, that we were all excited about and passionate about, and has a slightly different meaning nowadays. I think it does. Yeah, it was a little tongue in cheek as well, um, but I think the joke has worn thin. Um, but anyway, all of that is is a long way of saying it's great to have you back on the show. It's, it's probably been too long. Thank you. Um, and we're going to talk about digital transformation um, in COVID, post-COVID. Obviously, wow. these are areas um, on which I suspect you have a lot to say. The areas, digital transformation is an area in which you've been working now for a number of years. We've had many conversations. So let me start by asking you, is, is this the year when... Um, digital transformation really took root in the PR industry because of the dramatic changes in, in how we have been working, uh, living um, and consuming? I mean, I, for me, it's a resounding yes. I think that um, the the change in the very way that we communicate and the addition of technology into the mix and the, the focus on that really becoming one of the only ways to access other people Um, and read what's going on in the world has pretty much forced people who maybe were a little bit hesitant to lean into it um, into prioritising that. So I do think this is the year that it really became part of everyone's um, needs rather than just a want. Um, And for me, that's that's really exciting. And yes, it's been it's been tough and it's been a hard slog and, and we're not out of the woods yet. But for me, there's a lot of positives that we can take forward from that. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that there's lessons that everyone will, will bring forward into 2021. Mm. Well, that's encouraging and good to hear. So let's talk perhaps a little bit about some of the specifics. It, in what ways have you seen um, digital transformation and, and maybe digital innovation Uh, progress this year in ways that perhaps you hadn't seen before? I mean, there's a myriad of ways. I think let's start with the fact that now we're able to do things remotely. So there was always this ability to work with people easily or more easily in different countries and different spaces using technology. But I think because of that sense that I spoke about before, which is that force 
um, of, of, of that of being the only way you can do it, actually we're creating a lot of efficiency by doing that. So, you know, if I think back to uh, three or four months ago, we were um, we had our creative team um, logged onto a Zoom kind of um, stream to Japan. Um, from New York with a director in LA and then an on-the-ground production team um, in Japan actually shooting to, to have the input of both of those teams. Now, you know, that was something that we could have done before, for sure. Um, would it have been um, easier and more straightforward to be there in person? Possibly, but think about you know, the collaboration there that we were now able to achieve from having three teams who would have been investing a lot in flying to that shoot. Um, there would have been a lot of like, um, not chaos, but you know, th there's a certain element of having lots of people in the room at the same time is challenging. And, you know, I, I know that the teams um, had to work to crazy, crazy schedules to make that happen. But if you look at the positive of that, you know, we were able to be much more efficient, much more fast, um, and the communication that came about from that was, was really positive. So I think that is now something that we're going, well, let's think, think about how our production schedules um, and the way in which we approach giving feedback while we're going through shoots is made much more interesting because of the ability to do it remotely. Um, I think mm. there's also a sense of acceptance around that becoming the norm. Um, I think that a lot of clients that we work with are now looking at less premium, high production value content. Um, they are, they are mm. recognizing that their consumers are talking via Zoom or they're talking via Teams or whatever platform they want to. And they're seeing people in this more rough and ready, fast, realistic way. Um, and so they're kind of mirroring that. So really early on in the pandemic, we did some stuff for Adidas around that. Um, we helped to edit um, a series called The Huddle for them, which paired together influencers uh, on Zoom, and they just had conversations. And um, you know mm. that, that kind of acceptance around that type of content is really shifting. And I think, again, that for me is really exciting because it's about reflecting how people are talking. It's not about, always adding a very high gloss kind of premium element to stuff it's just being more realistic mm, so it's uh, maybe helping in terms of developing more authentic content okay. um, as you said not as highly produced um, once that's that genie is out of the bottle it's difficult to put it back in I would imagine Yes, and I think you see that from um, even like a lot of the things like real life events going online. So, you know, you imagine that once upon a time when we were working on um, the uh, project that we did for P&G with um, Queen Latifah, um, which was all around the Queen Collective, which is effectively supporting um, diverse female filmmakers, um, to launch that in the past, we would have put on a big event in person. Actually, what we ended up doing was an online version of that and components of that were things like Instagram Lives, where actually we had um, you know, part of our production team and part of our content and publishing team there to help moderate and guide um, and almost have like a live panel discussion. Now, that you, mm. we could have done that in person with press and media. But shifting that online and giving people the ability to interact and ask questions as we were going through that process and really opening that up to a bigger audience, I think that's really hard to step back from because, um, you know, as a brand, you recognize the openness that that brings and the, the, to your previous point, that, that sense of humanizing the brand. Um, and so I think that's another thing that I'm really keen that we continue to do. And to be honest, has been something that we've been advising for years and years. But to, to your earlier point about, you know, this genuinely being the year that it takes hold, now there's much more acceptance of that kind of approach. So, yeah, that sense of liveness is also an element to it. 
Mm. It revolves around the fact that we're just so integrated, you know, our lives now are so integrated with technology. Yeah. Um, but the public relations industry isn't always, or at least hasn't always been um, to the same extent. And that goes for the work that um, companies, clients produce. Do you think that there's greater sophistication developing um, in terms of whether it's digital tools, platforms, com tech, even things like the use of data and analytics? Um, or do you think that's still going to take some time? I think we're still a way away from sophisticated. Um, but I do think that mm. in the absence of being able to be with people in a room, you turn to things like um, monitoring services and analytics to try and understand what's being said and also with this heavy shift I mean already we were at kind of peak content and you know pe there was just ferocious amounts of digital content out in the world now there's even more um, and there's a lot of conversation that is moving at an incredibly fast pace so as a you know either on a global or a local scale to be able to properly understand that and pick through it and filter it, you have to use technology and you have to use really good analytics. So I think, again, there's been this, this shift towards having to get your, your kind of head wrapped around that. Um, and I do think that we'll see that evolve. I'm not sure if I could, to, yeah, to my previous point, I'm not sure if I could say sophisticated, but definitely we've, we've seen a big bump this year in both people doing it mm. and wanting to do it. And the wanting to do it is, is, mm -hmm. is heartening. Um, and I've definitely mm. seen that within our agency, you know, more, more team members of all levels and all ages wanting to understand how to use analytics tools. Um, and I think that's the first time mm. I've really seen a big shift in that. Mm. And just staying on this topic, have you seen any specific trends in terms of channels and platforms? I mean, obviously we had the rise of influencers. Um, are we still talking about a world in which the major social media platforms um, are still key? Yes. I mean, when you look at um, time spent with different channels, social is still you know, leading the pack for most groups. Um, you know, there's nuances depending on which audience set you break that down into, but there's still a heavy emphasis on that. Um, what I think we're going to see next year is more focus on people's uses for different platforms. So as they've matured mm. over the years, they really have worked out their role in people's lives. And I think now what you're seeing is people heavily leaning into that. You know, Facebook is always going to be an at scale ad platform um, and it's always going to be where people turn to to follow friends and family and then you know brands therefore are going to use that opportunity to get messaging in front of people's faces when they're in a captive space Twitter is really doubling down on the place for kind of breaking news stories and you know I think we'll continue to lean into that I think Fleets is going to be really interesting in terms of how media companies adopt that. Um, the disappearing nature of that is is interesting from a Twitter perspective. Um, I think the 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 way that media companies le kind of leaned into live within Twitter, there'll be some parallel between how they experiment with Fleets. But as I said, it's it's you know it's a breaking news platform, and then I think Pinterest is becoming fascinating as well. You know, when you look at the ability mm. to genuinely draw a connection between content and sales um, and the, the kind of mm. new um, ad features they're ve developing in there, I think that's, that's going to be really exciting when it comes to, to next year. Um, and, you know, and mm. Interesting. I wasn't, I was less aware of Pinterest as a, as, or at least its popularity it, as a kind of marketing Yeah, platform. and I think also if you look at... Um, you know, the way that they're recruiting at the moment, they're pulling in mm. senior strategic thinkers from the other platforms. And so I've, I've got my eye on it. And, you know, I could, I could go on and talk for another mm. hour about how all the platforms are really 
defining a role but I think for us as communicators that's actually really great because when you start to build your ecosystem it starts to give you clearer direction for what platform you would use um, for for what type of content and the role that they would play in the overall kind of marketing mix. Yeah, they are maturing now, yeah. I suppose. Um, uh, what about TikTok? I've got to ask you. <laughs> well, t- I mean, TikTok is challenging um, for us in the US to an extent, just because of the the mm-hmm. outgoing administration and, and their kind of belief on um, how that should be adopted within the country. But I think, you know, again, TikTok is that place for for people who have a, an element of humor or an element of movement to them to really explore and play. And I think that for them has become their niche. And over the next six months, we'll see how that kind of settles from a US adoption point of view. Um, but it's, you know, it's the o- it's one of the only new platforms in the past couple of years that really has made an impact. And I think we'll, we'll yeah. continue to see that grow over the next 12 months for sure. Are brands wary um, of TikTok because of, you know, the various challenges it's faced? I think cautious, not wary, perhaps. I I think there's Mm. just, Mm. I think at the moment there is just a lot of thoughtfulness around spend um, and where you put your investment and the, the potential kind of removal of that or investing in a platform that might not be um, able to be accessed by everyone you want to, um, I think people are putting extra care into for sure. Mm. Wanted to come back to the point on which you started the ability of digital platforms and digital technology to help us all collaborate, help people in your agency collaborate. Um, it sounds like you are quite impressed by the positives. Um, but how concerned are you about the negatives, the lack of physical interaction, um, perhaps a reduction in serendipity? Mm. Um, do you feel that the, the positives outweigh the negatives? I do. I mean, I'm very much glass half full constantly on most things. Um, but I do feel like the efficiency, the collaboration, um, the ability to humanize people, both from a brand level and also like an exec level um, does outweigh the negatives. I think that um, you know, I'm very lucky I'm in a business that is allowing us to almost rebuild and be flexible with what working looks like. Um, and I think a lot of businesses will, will follow suit. But part of that for me has to be safe and um, careful real life contact when that becomes something that's realistic and the balance of you know carrying forward those positives but also making sure that we do have moments for the teams to come and work together in real life um i think is is going to be the way forward for us because you know particularly with a large portion of um the innovation and creative team at h and k being creative led you know so much of that is about working with other people and getting instant feedback and working through a brief that I don't think we'll be able to do that purely remotely um, and I am looking forward to the, mm. the time where we can get everyone back together again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we all are. Um, but it's, it's good to, to talk about the positives, I think. It's, it's useful. What impact do you feel it's had on, um, on your teams? particularly maybe the kind of mid-level and junior uh, executives, do you think that actually working in, in this way has, has helped them in, in, in any I way? I feel like what this has done is it's created more touch points. So, you know, it can be overwhelming the amount of calls and town halls and webinars that get put on, um, but it, it does mean that there's more more regular contact face-to-face with... Um, you know other parts of the business from like senior leadership through to other sectors through to other offices so there is the potential to get more face time to learn from other people um, and do that more regularly so I think that's definitely a positive I think it's hard when you're um, 
when you're trying to learn um, and you're kind of you're developing your craft and you can't do it with your line manager or your team sat next to you because what would have been a simple question is now um, written over teams and you know writing something um, over kind of text whatever platform you use can the tone can sometimes be misread so I think that's probably quite challenging um, but you know I think what I'm certainly seeing from both inside our agency and clients is that people are just com committing so much time um, to just being available to people and that for me kind of balances out the trickiness of you know how much longer it takes to ask a question via email or via setting up a call. Mm. Is there much of a is there a steep learning curve when it comes to the various virtual working platforms that are available so we're doing this mm. on zoom but obviously as you mentioned there's teams then there's things like yeah. slack and trello and Basecamp and asana and all of these types of things now i don't know how embedded these kinds of things are in agencies i've always assumed they're less important because people mm. can meet in an office um are agencies ready to commit to to these kinds of um platforms and and you know they obviously do bring some opportunities but also some challenges yeah. too. I mean we don't have the choice like it, it's this or nothing mm. um, so I don't I I'm not sure if there's a steep learning curve but there's definitely um, as you flip from platform to platform because of client need it's just the frustration of the technical um, elements it's like mm. do you have this and in, this plugin installed do you have that permission turned on? Um, and that's just like a comical five minute start to every meeting when you've got multiple agencies in the mix. Um, but I think people do laugh mm. that off. Um, but in terms of being ready to adopt, like I said, we don't have a choice. It's like this or you don't, yeah. or you don't connect with your team. Um, and that's just not an option. So, you know, I think it's a good thing that actually we've seen lots of people, lots of people now adopt um, instant messaging or video calling in the face of email um, because you know email traffic for everyone is brutal um, so any anything that reduces that is good in my book mm, sure um, moving on uh, or rather coming back to the points you made about the, um, the kind of work mm -hmm. you're seeing this year uh, obviously Recent years, we've seen you know the rise of, of very visual content, um, a lot of stuff driven by video. Are there any trends you're seeing in terms of how uh, digital content may change, uh, whether that's this year or, or looking ahead from next year? Yeah, I mean, I think the the one area that we haven't spoken about um, yet in, in full is the influencer piece. Um, and, you know, it, the popularity of influencer marketing has been rising for a decade now. You know, it's not a new thing. And, and really, it's, it's never been a new thing. Talent and celebrities have always been used as spokespeople. Stakeholders have always been important to change reputation. And digital influencers then were added to the mix as kind of a natural evolution of this as we started to see social platforms grow. But what we're seeing now is genuine co-creation and you know I have been banging the drum for co-creation for years and years you know it's <laughs> you get far better value out of the relationships that you build with influencers um, if you genuinely find people with shared values and then you plan with them mm -hmm. um, and I think mm -hmm. now what we're seeing again is the output of 2020 forcing us to behave like that and what I mean by that is, you know, in Q2, probably, the amount of sponsored content from influencers dropped dramatically. And influencers were very cautious of doing anything commercial because it just wasn't appropriate at the time. And I'm thankful for mm -hmm. that. We've seen that now start to rise as the year has progressed. But what's happened is they've been so much more thoughtful about what they post they've been um, more meaningful, they've tried to find brands and issues that actually they can put their weight behind that mean something beyond just product placement. 
Um, so so mm. how that affects the way that we as an agency and then our clients interact with them is the the briefs are different, the objectives are different, um, and we're genuinely planning with people who are aligned to the, the kind of values of our of our clients. So again, like the the adoption of technology and the way we have to do remote production, we're being forced to do proper co creation, which you know, sound like a broken record, but I think it's a good thing. Well, it is a good thing. I suppose the only surprising element is that it took this kind of a crisis for this to happen. I mean, surely it should have been happening already. I, I can recall, you know, moderating an influencer panel a few years ago, and I think the three main gripes from influencers were, um, one, brands weren't necessarily aligned with yeah. them or that that didn't stop them taking the money but they weren't necessarily aligned with them two um brands weren't willing to let go uh in terms of control yeah. of the content and three was actually around money as yeah. i recall so but uh, two and three are those uh, do those continue to be challenges uh what's so the money and what was this Con uh, control i think um, so i have so because I used to write and and do journalism I've I've always been incredibly cautious of the idea of control right so you cannot ask someone to form a point of view or write something or review something and then influence what the output is like that's just not that's not the way to build a relationship with anyone I, so I feel like that's always been something that, that we as a business have done. But it is a challenge because, you know, I, I often see in the in the press, in the kind of trade press, influencers being called out for, you know, very inauthentic, very cheesy posts that don't look real and has, have obviously kind of been edited or, or whatever. And my feeling is always feeling a bit sorry for them because... Yes, they've gone down that path, but they've been directed down that path by either a marketer or a communicator. Mm. And so I think that we have to take responsibility for um, just how we brief influencers, what we're asking them to do, um, what we're asking them to write, how they craft and style those posts um, in order for us to give people the freedom to interpret things that, that they feel are real um but not end up in this weird situation where people are like creating fake worlds because they've been asked to do a bit of product placement for a, for a client um so yeah I, I do think the control mm. thing is i guess that's not control that's maybe that's maybe direction but i think it's all it's all in the same mm. space for sure mm. And money? I think the money thing is like the fact that we're still talking about money is is wild. You know, so, so many influencers. That's <laughs> their job. You know that that that's how they make their money. It's no wonder that um, they end up accepting briefs for, which are really cheesy or feel really inauthentic to them. You know, they're doing what they can to survive. Um, and I think that. You know, I wish that we had some kind of industry-wide benchmarking exercise or some kind of guidance around that so that both smaller and bigger agencies are, there's some kind of parity in the way that they're paying influencers. Um, but we still don't. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of discrepancy in, in payments. But, you know, we, we work to benchmarks and we work to kind of, defined rate cards for people so that they're, they're fair and equitable um, depending on reach and all kinds of elements and I think that really is the best way to do it to make sure that people are being paid fairly for their time and their investment. Mm -hmm. So you will be aware um, of this kind of argument from around a decade ago the public relations industry uh, because it had this opportunity via social media, this was going to enable them to really make inroads into marketing budgets, and in some cases even wrest that away from from advertising agencies or media agencies. And it didn't 
quite turn out that way. It did perhaps to some extent, but maybe not to the extent that some people had hoped. Do you think this year, given the, the pressure there has been on advertising and the focus on more authentic content, has perhaps the, have the events of this year perhaps given the PR industry more of an opportunity um, to play that kind of a yeah, lead role? I definitely think so, because I think, so even just taking the influencer example as, as one element of that, you know, what, what that co-creation requires is an earned first approach. It's about relationship building. It's about genuinely looking at what someone cares about and then thinking about how it's the most appropriate to connect them with the client that you're working for. It's not a media first buy where you're looking at numbers and reach and getting very into the weeds of kind of that transactional relationship. Um, Yes, we still do all of the analytics and all of the tracking to make sure that people are... um, the investment in certain individuals or influencers are like effective but the way in which you approach that as a PR agency versus any other is driven by relationship building and I think that gives us a tremendous um, amount of opportunity to lead in that respect Um, and also you know with the challenges that are going on in in the world at the moment that sense of reputation management and the content and the work that's put out into the world because of it Um, is you have to be thoughtful and again I think that puts us in a great Mm. position to lead because we understand the reputational impact of the content that we're producing and so therefore it makes sense that we would be a strategic partner to a client or a CMO in developing that Um, so I I do think we we're in a position as an industry where you know both of those elements as just two parts of the marketing mix we can lead, um, and there are many others. Mm. Do you think um, that will persist beyond the pandemic? Um, And do you think that perhaps, whether it's ad agencies or other types of agencies, they will start to get smarter about producing that kind of content that isn't so much about broadcasting but is about Mm. listening? I mean, I assume it's already yeah, happening to some definitely. extent. Definitely, and I think there are some amazing creative and ad agencies out there that do understand reputation. But I really do feel a, a focus on the combination of reputation management and creativity at the moment from our clients and what they're, mm. they're really in desperate need of is, is the consultancy around those two things. And while I think... A lot of agencies can do the creative very well. Reputation management is a very nuanced and specialist craft. And I think that there is no better type of agency than a PR business to to help clients through that. Mm. Well said. Um, Last question for you. Uh, Given all the changes of this year, some good, some bad, but... Um, quite profound, certainly in terms of, of this kind of virtual world we're in. What are the s- kinds of skills you're looking for now from whether that's team members you're hiring or whether it's members on your team that they should be looking to mm. develop? I think from a craft perspective, um, you know, we are being asked to do a, a ferocious amount of animation film production, editing, um, across both video and audio, just because people, the emphasis on needing to create dynamic content that cuts through is greater than ever. Um, So I think that from like a craft perspective, but also kind of conceptual thinking and the ability to really take a problem and think about big ideas and concepts to bring that to life. So I think those two areas are very prominent for me. And then on the content side, I think, you know, we're really seeing a return to great editorial and a desire for someone who can tell a really good story 
in a written way you know that is the, that's the cornerstone of a PR business someone who can write really well um, and I just think we're continuing to see a resurgence of that so it's you know it's both mm. ends of the spectrum it's both you know newer interactive skills but then it's also traditional skills and I kind of love to see the balance of that um, I've spent a lot of time over the mm. past couple of weeks doing um, in-depth interviews with real people um, for a client who want with real, real people. people who for a client who actually wanted to understand <laughs> how people were thinking and that for me was just this wonderful reminder of the fact that people want both they do want headlines and I can't tell you how many people told me that um, you know they still download an app you know a Wall Street Journal a New York Times an Economist and they headline scan and I it was just such a great reminder of the the core element of our craft as a PR business is really working out how to get that headline that is meaningful to a person that gets them to click through and then they went on to talk about, you know, outside of that, I want to see visual content and I want to understand data that I can just see in an instant. Um, so I think just building a team that's still capable of doing that's really important. Um, and then just people who mm. are resilient and want to kind of lean in still. So it's it's a mixture of those things. But I think, you know, teams mm. are going to look quite different next year. Um Mm -hmm. But that, again, it's a good thing from my perspective. Mm, yeah, no, very interesting, actually, to hear the range of things, especially, uh, as you mentioned, the, I suppose, f for want of a better word, the mm. traditional um, virtues of writing and, um, and, and being able to generate good mm. headlines. Above all, be, being resilient. Yeah. I think that's something that, uh, that we can all say we've learned this year. Vicky, thank you so much for your time. I asked you a lot of questions, so I really appreciate you um, taking the time to answer them you all. You are very welcome. It's a pleasure. And we'll get you back on the podcast soon. Have a good thank holiday. You. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Provoke podcast, brought to you by Provoke Media in partnership with Hill & Noble Strategies and produced by the international broadcast specialist Marketeers. Mm -hmm.